kept going on and on, and I kept hearing all these thousands of rounds of, of gun shooting, automatic, single. And sometimes it was really close, someone, sometimes it was far. It like moved from one area to another. That made me understand that it's not one class of terrorists. It's much more because they're here and they're there and they're there and they're there. And they could be everywhere. Please come. We're burning. They're burning a house. We hear. We hear them. We hear them. They're here. They're trying to break down my door. They're on the roof. They're shooting. Come, save us. The only thing I'm thinking of, let's get out of here. Let's yeah, be let's, evacuated. Let's stay alive. Let's stay alive. Let's stay alive. Bullets all over the place. In southern Israel, a few kilometers from the border of Gaza, is a kibbutz called Beri. About 1,200 people lived here. At least 108 are now dead. 10% of the community massacred. <laughs> Galit Carbone was one of them. The 66-year-old Australian-born woman was a mother, grandmother, sister and aunt. Her brother Danny spoke with us, supported by daughter Mika and son Roy. He agreed to recount the horror that unfolded in his community of Barry on Saturday morning, October 7. In shocking detail, Danny relives the day minute by minute, hour by hour. The day that would change his life and Israel forever. When did you know that there was something really wrong on Saturday? About seven o'clock, after I, I started, I went on my bike ride, every, like every Saturday, and then the, started the rockets in the air. It was like fireworks, really. It started to go um, really louder and louder. And then there was, uh, we don't have a siren back there. We have uh, a code, Seva Adom, red, red, red color. Seva Adom, which means you gotta go into your um, safety rooms. Or whatever there's a tech yeah and you have like eight. 15 seconds ah. we don't have 15 seconds, seconds. we've got 10, 10 but seconds. it says 15. So close to Gaza. yeah yeah i was just about to keep going i thought okay before the red alert um i thought i'll keep going okay it's gonna end up in a second and little i knew that at the gate of the kibbutz the terrorists were about to reach there and I was about three, four hundred meters from there, and I returned because of the red alert, and I returned to my home. So that's thank you, God. Thank God for one. And then, fifteen minutes after, um, I heard the shooting from my window. Uh, it was about one hundred fifty, two hundred meters from my house, and then at that moment, I knew something is wrong. It's about seven, seven, seven o'clock, I think. Yeah. Um, then seven fifteen, seven thirty, I got into my um, safety room and locked the door. And I talked to you about what that meant to me to lock the door. Locking the iron door behind me, it meant crossing a red line that was never there before for me, at least. That means if I've got to lock myself into a safety room because there's shooting inside my house, something is wrong. And there and then I started to feel that something is really wrong and we won't be the same. Later on I knew and I was sure that there's life before 10-7 and life after 10-7. Or as we say in Israel, 7-10, but we go with the American way. Anyway, 7th of October, it's the break line, it's the deadline. It's something that will make us understand that we've got our different lives and we'll talk about it after what really made the change. So tell me what happened next. So you okay. locked yourself in the room and, yeah. and then what did you hear? What, what... Okay, I locked myself in the room. Um, I think everyone's feelings were that it's a local attack and it will end in an hour, a couple of hours, by 
meaning that we annihilate everyone and, and that was it, you know. But it kept going on and on and I kept hearing all these thousands of rounds of, of gun shooting, automatic, single, and sometimes it was really close, Someone, sometimes it was far. It like moved from one area to another. That made me understand that it's not one class of terrorists, it's much more because they're here and they're there and they're there and they're there and they could be everywhere. They were. they were everywhere. Apparently afterwards, as we said before, there were a few hundred there. And um, I started texting, letting everyone, I opened the group, I said, please guys, please report what's happening. How are you? Where are you? What's your position? What's your situation? Are you locked? Are you safe? Um, unfortunately, I didn't bring any water or food inside. Um, I didn't bring a bucket to pee. And afterwards, uh, um, I couldn't resist and I opened the door and I listened to see if there's some, someone there, and I'm, even though I locked my door. And I had a pee. I got uh, um, a bag of some candy. I got a bottle opener. I got a bottle of wine and I got a bucket so I can pee. And I came back and locked my door. That was in the middle of the day and it kept going and rounds and rounds and in the local text messaging please come we're burning they're burning a house we hear we hear them we hear them they're here they're trying to break down my door they're on the roof they're shooting come save us please save what's her name she hasn't been in touch with anyone for the last hour all the time. It's all there. It's all there in the phone. It must have felt like Armageddon. It was Armageddon. And I thought, okay, it must end. The army surely will be here. We are on four and a half k's from the border. <coughs> surely, little we knew that they just broke in with dozers and ran it with some pickup trucks. And it's a f***ing pickup a, pick a tram army that's, that's killing us, you know? And, and, and it just seems really dark, you know. And then people say there's no electricity. And then if there's no electricity, you can't charge your phone. If you can't charge your phone, you can't report where you are. Danny described the final conversation he had with his older sister as her home came under attack. 12.09 midday, she rings me. And she's whispering. And she says, I hear them here in the house and I can't close the door properly. And I'm trying to be beef and, and try to be really cool. And I said, okay, we'll whisper and you try and hold the handle back towards you. And I keep encouraging her a little bit more. And then we say, okay, I'll cut down all the phone conversation so no one can hear us. And that was the end. I didn't hear anything from her afterwards, and neither her kids. And I presume 12.30, it was all over. Um, we didn't, in the group, we didn't really do much about it because we couldn't leave our places. We could, I couldn't just go out and see how's my sister going because there's shooting everywhere. Um, it's really, as it said, Armageddon, end of the world. And we just wait for the army. Please come, army, you know. It's the strongest army in the Middle East, in the world, really, you know. It's the Israeli defense. And nothing happens. And they arrived, I think, around 3 o'clock, 3 p.m. Started 7 a.m. Apparently afterwards we understood that um, there were bombs all over the gate where the army was supposed to come in and there were troops there that um, wanted uh, to avoid them from coming in. And little we knew that so many kibbutzniks were killed already by then. Then just the hours go by and you keep hearing all the uh, text messaging from, from the local uh, net and you say, what the f***, can't do anything about it, you're locked in here. 
everyone is locked, no one can do anything. And around 8.30 or so, I hear the army downstairs, I open and I see, and anyway, they come up to my stairs, I, uh, I live on the second floor, which is another blessing because they had too much to do on the ground floor, Plenty so, of targets, so like. they, they, they never bothered going up second floor, so Everybody. thanks again. Okay. And I open the door and they come in with their um, rifles right in front of me, um, just to make sure that I'm not a terrorist. Um, and they cleared the house and they said, okay, come with us. And then another step of horror started because they're getting us all together about, I think we were about 20 or 25 people from, they gathered all over the place, kids, elderly, on wheelchairs, everything. And the special unit soldiers were around us. And they said, okay, walk, okay, stop. Okay, walk, okay, oh, stop. And all the time we've got the background, there's fighting about 100, 200 meters behind us. Bullets all over the place. Um, you hear the, the you, Bullets, see, you hear grenades. the rounds. I did I heard some grenades as well, yeah. This it, is the police fighting with the terrorists at this point? The army. The army, the army, the the army against the terrorists because there Special was terrorists forces all over. The army. And and we saw dead bodies on the road, but then they moved us around so the kids won't have to go through that. And um, and eventually we got to the entrance to the kibbutz, which was all shattered. And then we saw hundreds and hundreds of troops there with cars, ambulances, armed cars, uh, ambies, everything, you know. And... Um, it's a beautiful community, right? It what, is. When you, what, when you finally got out, what did it look like? Can you describe? Everything shattered. Everything shattered. Everything was burnt. Houses were burnt. And I saw the fire from my window. It was about two houses for me. Everything's burnt. Afterwards, from the stories that people jumped from the second story with their kids, you know, there's some horrific and heroic stories all over the place which just keep coming out. But on you the walk on the, on the footpath or on the road and you see all the shells there from the, from the guns. What you heard a few hours ago, that the gunfight was just underneath your, your window. And you think, okay, I'm safe now. I'm safe now. Danny is now clinging on to his kids. There were times, he admits, where he didn't know if he would see them again, leaving voice messages from his safe room as his sister, friends and neighbours were slaughtered. This is Dad talking to us. Still shooting. I'm in the safety place. It's over two hours right now. So wow. Do you want to translate it? Shall I translate it? Um, what were you saying in that? I said a few things. I said that, listen, Chush, that's my nickname for Chush. Her name is Mika, but I call her Chush. Listen, Chush. I have no nickname. <laughs> <laughs> You're just Matoki, sweetie. I'm the favorite. <laughs> um, I said, listen, Chush, you can hear the background, the battle is still going, and it just moves from one area to another, what we talked about in the interview. It goes now to southeast or southwest and it's moving northwise and it was really then you heard all the rounds that going and it was really close and um, I don't know why why I wanted it to hear it maybe it was a mistake but I just felt like I don't know maybe it was a mistake I don't know um, but as I say it is what it is I did it and that's just one. There's probably about ten of them like that. Yeah, at least ten. And the gunshots just keep. Yeah, going. yeah. Keep the going. rounds all over. For hours. The, the rounds all over. Hours. Every now and then you think about my sister. Where is she? She's been kidnapped. Uh, she's lying dead in a house. You do think about it, but. 
what ended up happening? I mean, what do you know about what happened to your sister? What have you been able to That's a good question, out? Ash, because I did ask the guy that told me officially that they found her body and identified it. And I said, the first question was, where was she found? He really intrigued me. Where was she found? Did she battle in a house? Uh, did they drag her? Uh, did they try and, and take her to Gaza? What? Where? And I still up to now don't know any uh, to those questions, any answer to those questions. I presume in a few days, in a few weeks, I will get some answers, but I'm not holding my breath on it. What was her spirit like? Is she, was she the type of woman that you think w would have sort of tried to fight? Or? She's sick. She's got asthma and all kinds of illnesses. She couldn't resist. She couldn't resist whatsoever. That's why I find it a little bit um, weird that she wasn't found in the house. So I thought, okay, maybe they left her and she escaped her and tried to hide in the bushes, trenches. I don't know. Because Mo her body was found outside, outside the house. Outside the house, but I don't know where. So um, my fantasy, vivid imagination takes me all kinds of places. But at one stage, I thought, okay, I need to know. And the second, I said, yeah. doesn't really matter, yeah. you know. This is what is so horrifying about what they've done. You just said that she wouldn't have been able to resist. No, nah, not so much there was ever. Just, it was just so barbaric. It was. This isn't war. This is something else. It's just pure evil. I mean, targeting women and children and people who are defenseless. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's out of the... Games rules, it's out of it. You know, it's something you you don't do. Let's say if if you have war, if you have babies, war, there's rules. Kids. Sort of Someone fine. said that um, my neighbor um, and his daughter had uh, bullets in the head, both of them. And that that the thing shows. You they know? hang a baby with a rope outside of the door. I can't say it. It's in theory. Yeah. They hung a baby with the rope. Yeah, that's after, even after they I, killed it. That's they something I didn't know, really. Seriously, I didn't know that. I'm shocked. I'm shocked. As much as I can be shocked, you know. Every time you think you've heard a exactly, story, you exactly. Hear a story that's I didn't want to say it uh, until now, but I think it's really important to say it. That's as what, much that's as it's tough to yeah. say. That's why they're here. That's what they do to us. They did to us in the last uh, two days, three days. <coughs> yeah. There is no moment in history. What can you compare this to? It's I'm afraid to say this war, this war, but uh, maybe the Holocaust or something. Someone was comparing to Holocaust or to Babi Yar or to um, I don't know. Um, they just killed us for who we are, for Jewish people living in Israel. That's the reason, the main reason they killed us. They killed all their loved ones just because this, because they're Jewish and they live in Israel. What do you want people to know about your aunt and what do you want people to know about your sister? That she was a lovely woman, kind woman. She loved us. She loved us so much and their kids. She and we'll be sister. strong. So we will be strong for our kids and for our grandsons. This is our, our duty right now. Yeah, she left, she left behind uh, three kids and one, two, three, I can four. comfort for one thing that she saw her three kids get married and bring children to this world. And she saw her grandchildren. Yeah. What was your childhood like in Australia and how did you end up in Israel together? Wow. It's a good question. It's a very good question. Um, don't kill me if I won't be able to answer, Ash. But um, I went to um, first grade at Rose Bay. Rose Bay, yeah. Um, I remember my teacher, everything. Uh, I remember living in Bondi. We lived in Bondi, uh, Palm Street. Don't remember the number. Um, I remember good, good, good memories. 
and uh, we both didn't really understand why the fuck are they taking us to somewhere that it's Arabs and desert. What's Israel in 1968? It's nothing. It's one year after one year after the Six Day War, which, by the way, lots of uh, South Africans, Americans, English, Australians made the move to Israel. It was really the Zionist movement one year after the, day, the Six Day War. It was a big victory and everyone, all the Jews were proud and all the Zionists made the move to Israel. So um, that was part of it. Um, and I've got good memories from the kibbutz, really have. Yeah, I have a good memory. Um, I, I decided to stop answering my folks in English because I wanted to learn Hebrew and I didn't want to be different. Um, so um, very quickly I learned Hebrew. Um, as you hear, my English isn't really well because I don't practice it so much. But um, yeah, but then afterwards I came back. I knew always Australia's home for me. You're both obviously very uh, so proud that you uh, decided to get some tattoos to prove it. Yay! The kangaroo sign. <laughs> the kangaroos will have to get you to show us properly because that is very impressive. Yeah, yeah it's their idea, by the way. <laughs> that is very impressive. I thought it's very funny because we have these signs in Israel for camels and cows. Yeah. <laughs> in Australia, we have the kangaroos and we're like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's their idea and it's I... Really good. I yeah, I love it. I love it. Where does it leave you all in terms of, I mean, <clears throat> you, you were living so close to Gaza. Where does it leave you now when you think about, uh, when you think about what's ahead of you? It feels like Israel has such a big fight ahead of it now that this is really existential. I mean, wh what do you want Australia, what do you want the world to know about what's happening in Israel right now? Okay, I, I'll start. Yeah. I think that um, I think the most of uh, the Israeli citizens would like to have peace with their neighbours. I remember as a seven, eight, nine, ten year old, we used to go take a car and go to the Gaza Strip for Saturday, go to the cane market, go have hummus, go to the beach. It was lovely. I want that again. That's what I want. I want us to have an open border or no border at all that they can come in, no terrorism, no bomb attacks, no nothing, and we'll go and, and, and fill the economy with all what, you know, mm. go to the restaurants, buy their stuff, mm. as it was 50 years ago, 40 years ago. There's an old saying that uh, the Prime Minister of Israel said like 40 years ago, Golda, Golda, during, Golda was during the Yom Kippur War. Yeah, 40, 50 years ago, she said, when, when our enemies put down, will put down their weapons, there will be no war. When Israel will put down their weapons, there will be no Israel. And I think it tells the whole story. I'm, I'm not a lefty, but I raised my kids <clears throat> to love, really, not to hate. Even when we used to go to football matches, I said, Cheer for your team. Don't, Don't curse rubbish the other, the other yeah. team. You know, that's that's the basic, I think. The moment that you guys saw each other, <laughs> tell me what was that like? It was pretty emotional. He came to the hotel today and I saw him <clears> at the <throat> lobby and it was the second time I broke down. Yesterday I broke down with a, a guy, a friend of mine that lost his own son, his wife's son and 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 wife and two kids so he lost five persons of his family so I fell into his arms and we cuddled and we broke down and today I broke down when Roy came and tonight um, after we left the hotel I went to visit a friend of mine that uh, got his leg chopped off from the knee and he lost his wife and one mm. of his sons and it's just you go from one disaster to another and then you get here and you see Chushi and you break down again. And it was the third time I broke down uh, in the last two days. And still I'm trying to be as beef as I am, but I'm really a softy. I'm not really beef. I'm just putting on a I've show when I need to. Like this, what are the, like te the tears being for? Don't know. Just, just, <clears throat> the 
just came. Maybe relief. It's just as hard as, as I don't know. Sound to say it, a relief to see my dad. Like I don't know. Maybe maybe the miracle that we're together. I told you I just want to do this to feel him, to know that he's here and he's alive, to to physically feel him. Yeah. I said to them, guys, I can't wait till I sniff you. I wanted to sniff you. Such a relief, right? It is such, such a relief. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a uniting after, <coughs> you know, after something horrifying that could have ended differently, easily could have ended differently, so easily. From what you heard in the last 30 minutes or whatever, it could have ended in any other way but this way. Yeah. There could have been so many scenarios. Um, and I'm sure it's just so many emotions all at once because it's it's the relief, but then you've got so much grief that you've still got to, oh, got yeah. to work through. And and yeah, it's absolutely. Just, we don't even know what's no. coming. No. What and do you, you don't do? know what's next. No, so absolutely. Much unknown. The, the, the world should know that uh, 9.2 million people will be scarred forever after these few days, will be scarred forever. True, so, true. kids, women, For generations. Men. True, true. It, it will change Israel. Oh yeah, forever. absolutely. Forever. Like it changed me, it changed them, it changed everyone, everyone. There's everyone in Israel that's got related or knows someone that's related to someone from Berlin, Niroz, Kfaraza, Sderot, or whatever. You know all the all the Otefaza, mm -hmm. and um, um, Israel is really a small community mm -hmm. and really tight, mm -hmm. even though there's big differences politically, way right and and uh, right, right and left. left. Yeah. This is the times where we come together. Try to unite. Yeah. Yeah. Being together, it's the only way we can we can get out of this disaster.